So good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for the second annual George T. Kolaris Intelligence Conference, which is co-hosted by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and Georgetown University Security Studies Program. My name is Ellen McCarthy, and I'm so very proud to be your master of ceremonies. I think that's better than mistress of ceremonies, but we'll leave it at that. Um, I'll tell you, so almost since the beginning of the US intelligence community, um, its focus has been on intelligence integration. And I think it's fair to say that since 9-11, but most especially since um, the, the administration of this director of national intelligence, integration has really been our main focus. And that really is the underlying theme of this conference today, which is really about succeeding. The, the title is Succeeding in the Open, but it's really about how do we succeed in the open in an, an environment where um, open source data, um, this drive to uh, work more closely with the private sector, um, has become the name of the game. Um, also, technological advancements are just um, moving at a voracious pace. And then with uh, the various security leaks um, that have sort of become the new normal for the intelligence community, how do we operate in that environment? So we're gonna explore how the growing need for transparency has changed the way we engage our partners and analyze threats and whether working at the United States Coast Guard, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, or the Director for National Intelligence, helping to integrate intelligence among national security partners has remained a critical priority for me. And so I'm so very proud to be a part of this community and here with you today. I encourage you all to re remain engaged throughout today's discussions. Um, you'll notice that um, some note cards have been provided, so please, throughout the course of the day, if you have a question, just write the question down and someone will be around um, to capture your question. Um, also, con considering that this is the new norm, and since many of us have brought these with us today, I would also encourage you to use technology to uh, ask a question. Um, so just type in hashtag NGA at GU and we'll receive it that way. Also, please take advantage of the breaks that are um, sprinkled throughout the course of the day. It's a great opportunity to network, meet new people, network with your colleagues. I'd also like to remind the attendees here that there will be a career fair in Copley Hall from 11.30 to 1.30. We have a very full agenda today and hope you're all are as excited as I am. I'd like to welcome, at this point, our first speaker to the stage, which is Georgetown University's Provost, Dr. Robert Groves. Dr. Groves. Good morning. I'm here just to welcome you on behalf of all my colleagues at Georgetown University. We're thrilled to host this important conference, Succeeding in the Open. And we note that it follows up on last year's inaugural symposium that was a, a critical success in, in our viewpoint. So you're here to help all of us think through the challenges facing uh, us in the 21st century. I'd, I'd like to thank those uh, who've helped organize this. I'll, I'll, I'll start with uh, Bruce Hoffman, Professor Hoffman, Director of the Security Studies Program at the School of Foreign Service here at Georgetown. If you don't know Bruce, uh, you should know that he and his team uh, from the Center on Security Studies have worked tirelessly along with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency to plan and organize this event. Uh, and we're all in, in their debt for this. I also think it uh, important to, to convey our gratitude for the generosity of the George T. Calaris Intelligence Studies Fund in sponsoring today's proceedings. The Calaris Fund provides stipends for students studying intelligence as one of the core concentrations of the security studies program. It provides research funds and one of its main goals is uh, to provide Georgetown the capacity to uh, host forums like, like this one. And we're honored uh, today to have the Calaris family being represented by Stacy and Paul Crush. Uh, thank you, Stacy, uh, for being here and for your family's service to the US government and to Georgetown and the commitment to foreign links such as these between government and, and the academy. Finally, I, I wanna thank 
uh, those of you who will speak today, um, you make a forum like this run. I realize that you're all very busy and we are honored by your decision to take time to be with us, to be with us today. And then one final note, um, Georgetown has as one of its missions uh, the formation of women and men in service of others. I can't think of a better reason to gather minds together uh, than the reason we are pecking away at today. And we view this as a great opportunity to help in that formation process of the next generation of those who will serve these, these goals. So thank you for being here. It's my pleasure now to introduce Robert Cordillo, Director of the National Geospatial Intel Intelligence Agency. Bob. Thanks, Dr. Grove, uh, uh, for those opening remarks. Thanks, Alan, um, a teammate uh, of NGAs and the ICs uh, for a long time and a good friend. Uh, it is uh, delightful uh, to be here. Um, uh, we purposefully uh, thought about uh, our title for today's uh, conference, and there's a reason uh, that we need to figure out uh, how to be successful in the open. I'll speak more about that in a minute. Uh, thanks for joining us here. Uh, I'll also add my thanks to the Claris family, um, specifically to, uh, Tom Claris, who endowed this foundation, made this conference possible, uh, as well as to Georgetown. So on behalf of the agency, uh, we're honored, we're privileged uh, to be here. Uh, Georgetown and NGA have a lot in common. Uh, we both seek men and women who are responsible and active participants in civic life. We're both committed to producing lifelong learners. We both challenge our people to think critically about the future and what are appropriate skills, capabilities, and values uh, to, the, to meet those future needs. Plus, for me, it's a little more personal. Uh, I was a student uh, of this program uh, back in the late 80s. And uh, while I know many things have changed uh, since then, uh, uh, it's great for me to be able to return uh, and, and partner again with Georgetown. Uh, some things haven't changed. Georgetown's reputation uh, has stayed the same, uh, but other things have, uh, especially in our community, the intelligence community, which is why we're here today. Uh, and let me just say from the outset that uh, there'll be things that will be said from this podium and from the chairs and from our panels. Uh, it's equally, if not more important to me, uh, is what we hear back from you. So please uh, do uh, engage. Uh, the whole reason uh, for us to have this conversation, and that's what I hope we have uh, in such a forum, is so that we can, we can hear from you. Um, uh, but why this session? Uh, why succeeding in the open? Uh, I won't belabor the point, but suffice to say, uh, as the DNI, who will be here later, has said often, uh, arguably, uh, the threats that we face uh, throughout the globe uh, have never been greater, never been more diverse, never been more challenging. And, uh, and those threats include, but aren't limited to, uh, cyber, uh, radical and extreme terrorist groups with now the ability to project their effects globally, regional conflicts, global implications such as the ongoing conflict in Europe spilling out uh, into Europe as we speak, China's continued efforts to expand their ability to project their power, and the reemergence of Russia on the international scene. Now, the second reason uh, that we're emphasizing uh, this, uh, this point about succeeding in the open is the potential, the upside, um, especially in the profession that we represent at NGA. Uh, never has there been a time, okay, in which there's more value on the outside of our building as there is on the inside. What I mean by that is, and we talk about a growing transparency uh, of our profession, what I mean by that is that there are academic and commercial and non-governmental efforts, um, uh, humanitarian relief organizations, uh, aid organizations, that are now enjoined uh, in what we used to do, what I called when we had the monopoly. And that monopoly existed uh, in a very specific way because one of the high costs, the barrier of entry, two, the high cost of classification, another barrier of entry, 
And three, the nature of, not that it was a disconnected planet, but it wasn't uh, connected in the way we are today. So whether we're engaged in understanding of the meaning of the melting of the uh, uh, Arctic, or the implication of the national security challenge of Ebola in West Africa, or the recovery that's required in a disaster as in Nepal, NGA Geospatial Intelligence needs to find a way to convey its value to places that are just not traditional for us. No classification, no clearance, no account, no password, and yet we have to find a way to provide value. And we're literally thinking through this and learning through this as we speak. So today's a very important for event for us uh, uh, to have such a discussion. And I'm gonna adjust the schedule a little bit. I'm gonna close my remarks here because I'd like to begin chatting with Damien uh, and then hearing from you as well. So again, can I just thank you all uh, for, for coming here today. Uh, please do join in in the discussion, whether it's formally at a mic or on a card. Uh, or at a break, and even more importantly, uh, tomorrow and the next day. But thank you all very much. Damien, you want to join me on stage? Thank you, Director. Good to see you. Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Damien Paletta, I'm National Security and Intelligence Reporter for The Wall Street Journal. I'm Director, I feel like we should be talking about philosophy or theology in this room. It's so beautiful. But uh, if we could kind of jump right into the news, there's been such an increased focus um, in the public recently about Syria mm -hmm. and the challenges the intelligence community faces there, whether it's the Islamic State or um, what we're seeing with what Russia is, is doing. Can you tell us a little bit about NGA's role, what you guys are observing, and what you're contributing to the uh, IC's analysis on this? Sure. And and I'll try not to take the whole time on this sure. one question because it's very broad and, and there are many different aspects to it. But it, it, at the highest level, what NGA owes to our customers in and around Syria is context. Um, historic, temporal, demographic, cultural context. And uh, I often like to say that uh, we need to start with the premise that, that the, when you say the word or think the word Syria, oftentimes you'll go to that Rand McNally map and you'll think of those borders. And I often challenge our analysts, I said, look, that's often not helpful these days because it provides a sense, even though we know the borders are meaningless in certain places, when we still draw that line, Mentally, it gives you some comfort. Ah, this can be contained here, uh, there's a barrier there, and there's a way to manage through this, this crisis. So we try to create some discomfiture uh, in our readers to make them stress their thinking about the policy implications, which is not our job. Our job is to describe as well as we can the scenario, the situation, and then move ahead of this, today's scenario to anticipate you know, the next days and the next year's actions. So all to say that's our responsibility is, is contextual uh, at, at all those different layers. With Russia in particular, has there been anything, anything that's happened in the past few weeks that's raised alarm? I know you've said before the relationship between Russia and Damascus is not a new thing. Mm -hmm. They share a border. Um, but is there, has there been more that's happened there that, that the IC mm -hmm. or that the U.S. government need, needs to be monitoring more closely? Yes, uh, indeed. Um, so, right, to, to your point, I mean, Russia and Syria is a long-term relationship. The Soviets and Syria have a long-term relationship. The Russians have had a presence in Syria. The Soviets have had a presence in Syria for decades. However, what we've seen in the past month is different. Right? This, is, this is a different uh, deployment. It's a different level of force. It portends different intentions. I talked earlier about, sure, we can set um, the table, right. right? That frame, um, just as your newspaper, okay, can set that table today, given the commercialization of the parts of our business. But what my customers turn to me for is for the implications of that deployment. 
Um, I'll not speak a lot about that today because uh, it's not a proper forum for that, but, but, but I can talk about it in a more generic term. So what's really, to me, the, the more important question is not what, but why. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the motivation, right? What's the intention? Uh, oh, by the way, Ellen rightfully mentioned integration. Please don't think of geospatial intelligence as out on its own here, right? We're, right. we're a contributor to a much broader community, many of whom will share this stage today to try to get to those two, you know, why and what's the intention. You, you mentioned the community. Um, the, the theme of, of our discussion is building trust. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's been a lot about the intelligence community in the press the past few years, the NSA, the CIA. Um, your agency has not been in the press, but you're part of the broader intelligence community. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with the public and also with Silicon Valley, um, you know, commercial firms that, uh, you know, maybe you're looking at you guys differently based on some of the scandals and how you've had to work to rebuild trust? Sure. So, uh, Director Clapper has described geospatial intelligence as uh, the most transparent discipline within the intelligence community, and I think he's right. What he and I mean by that is that um, well, it's a couple of things. One, I already talked about how the, the tools of our business have moved from only government owned, so that's the years of the 70s, 80s, even into the early 90s, have now transitioned to commercially and foreign and uh, openly owned, if you will. So those sensors, right, flown by US companies and foreign companies and foreign countries, have created a new awareness of our planet in ways we've never had it before. So that's by definition more open. I suppose we could choose to try to raise our wall higher and keep our classified world you know, more segregated. Right. I happen to think that that's, that's a losing proposition for two reasons. One, it would be denying the reality that my customer is, lives in both worlds. And so I've got to be able to cross those as well. And two, I think there's great value in that, in that other world. You mentioned Silicon Valley. We're, we're quite excited about NGA, about Secretary Carter's engagement in Silicon Valley. We're looking uh, on our own and with Secretary Carter at ways that we can leverage the innovations that ha that's happening uh, through the evolution of these, these new capabilities. The way I see it, as the commercial capability rises, I want to add my value on top of that new foundation. Does it mean we won't still have you know, exquisite and, and capabilities that need and should be protected from adversaries' understanding? But it does mean, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that we should be open about what we can offer to the scientific understanding of the Arctic, to the, to the medical uh, needs in Ebola, and to the recovery needs in Nepal. We did all three of those things on the World Wide Web. Um, anyone can go on to nga.mil and log into the data that we've posted for common use. One of the things I think that fueled the um, backlash over, especially, specifically the NSA, was a confusion about the limits of surveillance. Mm -hmm. Can you, I think a lot of people don't have a good understanding about, you know, they think NGA, they think, you know, Cold War satellites. Right. Right. Can you talk a little bit about some of your source methods, but also the limits to what you guys do? Absolutely. Um, uh, I need to be crystal clear. I have no authority. I have no authority to apply my capabilities against the United States, person, territory, et cetera. I am obligated, okay, when I'm tasked through a lead federal agency, so think FEMA, DHS, FBI, for a specific use. And then we go through the legal review, proper use statements, et cetera, to apply that task. So for example, there's another speaker in a little bit across town, okay? With a Jesuit background. With a Jesuit background. <laughs> um, making, oh, it, and obviously there's a lot of security that's required around his visit. NGA provided to the Department of Homeland Security, TSA, FBI, et cetera, uh, DC police, that contextual foundation to provide that said security. But again, it's, it's, it's for that specific use, for that specific application. Um, long way to say, 
We are a foreign intelligence uh, organization. We provide situational awareness and, and locational dominance for the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. And again, it's externally focused. Can we talk a little bit about the evolution of NGA? Um, college students use social media. We've learned terrorists use social media. Um, the, there's, a, there's a geospatial um, connection there. I mean, we, we saw with the MH17 um, incident in the Ukraine, um, there, wa there wasn't perhaps a lot of satellite imagery involved, but there was a tremendous amount of social media activity. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how you guys have had to adapt to this phenomenon and use that to you know, benefit what you do? So the, let's stick with MH17 and the shoot down. Um, that's a team sport, all right? And so this is an integrated response. I'm just gonna talk to the NGA contribution to that response. Um, Within 24 hours, 48 at the outside, uh, we knew 90% of what we eventually knew. I mean, we had a good handle on what occurred. Uh, then the work, so that was kind of the physicality of what happened, mm -hmm. you know, altitude, speed, missile uh, uh, detection, et cetera. But then, uh, you know, the attribution is the key question, right? And, uh, we leaned heavily, now we being the IC, leaned heavily on uh, social media, uh, open press, et cetera, uh, in the following way, that, that because everyone in here, I presume, is, has their smartphone, they have a sensor, and you, you all are using that, you used it either to get here today, or you're planning where you're gonna have lunch, right, or which route will get out of here, given right. the other visitor in town and all that. But two, let's face it, that, that you'll also document you know, uh, things that are happening around you. Now, I need to be mindful here. Again, we're, remember my other, earlier statement about what we do and don't do okay, with our capabilities. But in this case uh, of Eastern Ukraine, uh, we uh, work with the Open Source Center, okay, a DNI uh, enterprise, to understand what else could we find out beyond our capabilities about possible attribution. And, and part of that story became um, um, local, local you know, social media postings you know, in the town from which the, the missile emanated, which helped then, wasn't dispositive in and of itself, but contributed to that 90% that helped us tell that whole story. Is the idea, and this I guess relates to cyber as well, that even though these things can be mm -hmm. intercontinental and in the cloud or whatever. Every cyber attack or every social media post originates at a specific location. Right. And so you guys have had to, it's not like looking at a missile on, or a, you know, a plane on a landing strip. There's a, another way to get, it, get at that. Yeah, so let's turn a little bit talk more broadly about NGA, geospatial intelligence and, and the cyber, the, the rise of the import and the effect and the threat of cyber activity. Um, I think all too often as we began to understand the nature of, and, and let's face it, the, the positive nature, okay, of finding your next cup of coffee and getting home safely and all that, versus the nefarious nature uh, of that threat when it's reversed on you. Oftentimes, we would use this term, we would say, well, it's a virtual world, right? It's, you know, it's in cyberspace. Right. And I think that was a disservice in some sense because you just said, well, it's, it's anywhere and it's everywhere. So I can't get my head around it. So my answer to your question earlier on Syria was about context. It's the same answer in the cyber world. Everything resolves to a physical space. So. And understanding that physical space of that cyber activity, again, isn't dispositive, but does, again, add additional information to attribution, intention, purpose, et cetera. That's where we're going, uh, again, to, 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 to be that contextual foundation for whether it's Admiral Rogers or Director Brennan. Uh, how has, speaking of Syria, how has the, um, Islamic State changed or made you guys evolve uh, mm -hmm. what you do. It's, mm -hmm. not, there's, it's not necessarily a traditional military. Mm -hmm. um, it's, 
you know, they, a, a good guy can become a bad guy. It's mm -hmm. kind of hard to tell. How, how do you guys have, how have you had to change what you do it's, based on their development? It's been a huge challenge. And, you know, let's stick in, in Syria to talk about the two ends of the spectrum. I mentioned coming here to Georgetown in the 80s. I was a young analyst at the time. And so I would have been doing most, my analysts would have looked a lot like the Russian analyst, uh, you know, on the coast of Syria. Mm -hmm. There's four of those, there's eight of those, it's this type, right. it was built in this year, it's got this capability. It was very fact-based, right, because it's, uh, it's nice and it's neat. Um, that's the old, by the way, that's still required. Okay, if we've, got, right. we've got state adversaries in which we need to understand their military capabilities. I mentioned China's growth as one example. You talked about ISIS, so now move eastward, right, uh, into Raqqa, right, and, and across what used to be the border between Syria uh, and Iraq and to the ISIL-held territory. Um, Tikrit is a great example, right? Uh, you know, as ISIL came down from Mosul and began to threaten Baghdad, they, for some time, took the town of Tikrit. Um, and there was uh, a great push um, uh, from uh, both Iraq and Iraq uh, allied uh, uh, supporters, to include us, uh, to retake that town. Um, we were not then in the business of going, oh, look, there's two of those and four of those. That's ob obviously an ISIL company or unit. We then had to go to those other features that I talked about. Uh, broadly, we call it human geography. So this is, uh, this is culture, this is demography, this is tribal relations, et, et cetera. Um, those aren't as easily discriminated, okay, when you're looking at an image. Right. This is where, again, we need alternative sources to understand the nature of that terrain, the history, uh, what's the local governance structure in that area? Now, my answer is floating inside and outside of NGA. I mean, oftentimes, my friends at Langley will have the lead on that information. So my friends at Bowling Air Force Base. My job, then, is, is to put all that together. So it becomes a much more nuanced job for my analyst because the signature, which is very bright and shiny, quite literally, mm -hmm. okay, over on the Russian airfield, is, is much more subtle when you get to that's an ISIL-controlled part of town versus that's a, an Iraqi government-controlled part of town. Um, the, you guys have done a lot of work on humanitarian um, crises. You mentioned the earthquake in Nepal, uh, also the outbreak of Ebola in West mm -hmm. Africa. Now with this migrant crisis um, from Syria into many parts of Europe, is that something that you guys play a role in, in terms of the U.S. government's uh, mm -hmm. analysis and monitoring? Imagine it's hard to watch, you know, a migration like that and know yeah. what to make of it. So, yes, we have a role. Um, it, is, it is, again, more on the contextual side and a, a, both a geographic and a demographic scope. We're not, you know, nobody's calling us because they want to know when 500 or 1,000 migrants are about to right. approach a certain border, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's way better local sensors that can do that for them. I think what my job is, is to talk about what's the potential for the next wave, which could be a month or six months or 12 months out. And so we do try to provide an understanding of whether it's North Africa or the Middle East, signatures or indicators that we can pick up on, on you know, what be not, not today's wave, but but tomorrow's. Could we see a wave from Yemen? I mean, is there stuff like that that, you're, that are on your radar, or is it not quite gotten to that stage yet? Um, I think the answer, I, I think I'm comfortable with the issue could. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, again, I'll, I'll not want to go into, you know, the hows of that, but, uh, but look, in a whole different way, right, we've had migrant crises from Cuba before. Right. And in some instances, okay, we can provide our capabilities because quite frankly, and at least in that case, because it's island, you know, to, yeah. to Florida, well, there are indicators, right? Oh, you know, and to help the Coast Guard understand, you know, where, uh, where the next wave uh, may be coming from. 
Um, some of that work's going on in Libya, you know, with the very dangerous crossings that are going on. Uh, I was just in Italy last week, and a great deal of effort on their part to try to understand how do you mitigate some of that risk because of coming, trying to come across in unsafe vessels. Um, well, last question for me, and then I think we have some audience questions as well. The, uh, a week from today, the government's only funded for another week by Congress. And there's been, in the past, a lot of confusion about what um, you guys are a .mil, so you know, what parts of your organization would be continue to operate mm -hmm. and what would not. Can you give us a sense about, on October 1st, what happens to NGA if there's a government shutdown? So I, I operate under many rules and strictures, uh, one of which I operate with appropriated funds from the Hill. And so you're correct that as of now, my funds, my appropriated funds will lapse a week from today if nothing happens. First of all, we think there's time to get this fixed. We think Congress has the wherewithal to fix it. Uh, however, I would not be doing my job if I wasn't preparing if it doesn't happen. So you're exactly right. We're going through, and unfortunately, we're getting good at this uh, because we've done it before, um, <laughs> where we have to go and identify, okay, which are the mission essential operations that the country can't afford? And now for my workforce, it's, it's a very frustrating experience, right? You're, you're part of our national security. You're important to the future of the country. We're not gonna pay you, okay? Uh, but we need you to still come to work. Now, and oh, by the way, for the folks that are told, you know, I mean, it's always a nice message to get to, by the way, you're not essential. Right. You know, just, yeah, go take the day off. I mean, look, it's, it's I don't mean to make light of it. It, 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 it eats away at you. So I'll finish with my optimism. There's time, okay, there's a way to get this addressed, but we are preparing for the worst case. Do you have a sense what percent of your workforce it would impact in terms of furloughs? I do, and I'd rather not say. Okay, yep. okay, fair enough. We have questions. Uh, submitted via Twitter from Chris Reyes. Um, Director, what effect do you see the availability of commercial imagery and small satellites having on the work role for imagery and analysis? Uh, tremendous. I mean, again, that's, uh, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, let me also say, too, that We've been in the commercial imagery business for a long time. Uh, I have a mission and partner called Digital Globe, uh, which essentially I can't do my job today without them. Uh, and they're not a startup, okay? This is a, right. you know, a major company providing significant effort to both my mapping, charting, geodesy, and my intelligence mission. Uh, the question talks to, yep, there are more people joining this field um, in different ways, and some of them are doing it for very, you know, Google's got their particular reason for putting up satellites. Planet Labs has a different kind of vision for their contribution. Um, I'm relatively agnostic as to why they're putting them up. I'm just looking forward to seeing how I might be able to leverage the fact of them putting them up. Is the um, development of commercial drones a good thing for you guys, a bad thing, a worrisome thing? Uh, I'm gonna go back to agnostic. Okay. I mean, I know there's a whole lot of other implications about safety and trafficability and all that, but I love imagery, and I tend to, remember the legal thing I gave you earlier, right. okay? I care <laughs> where that imagery is pointed at, but beyond that, I'm happy to take whatever is available. Um, here's a question from Robert Tomes. Um, if you succeed in transforming NGA into the most open and transparent intelligence agency, what will be different about NGA's workforce, products, and partnerships with the industry? So um, let me just use my experience to try to give you an answer. So when, when, when I was hired into this business, you know, I was taken into a very dark room scared uh, about uh, security and signed 18 different things. I think my firstborn was somewhere obligated in case I violated any of these. And I shouldn't make light. It was important to have that. But, but then I was raised in this thou shalt not mentality. Right. You know, you just can't afford to risk any exposure of our capabilities. Today's workforce and the one that if we are successful here, is going to have to be much more both comf comfortable and agile in moving back and forth. And 
arguably that's a much more difficult existence, right? To be able to do both. Because I don't want to give you the message that, that when I say succeed in the open is we're just gonna take off all the classification, do all our work, you know, uh, completely openly because there are nefarious actors uh, on this planet that would benefit greatly uh, from that. And we need to be able to protect sources and methods and still. So, so I need more agile workforce. Um, I, look, I don't control the personnel system in the US government, but I think our, our personnel system needs to become more agile. I'd be much happier. I think the agency would be much healthier if I had greater movement between academia, industry, uh, and my workspace. The, here's a question from Zlatko Karin, a GWU student. With intelligence being increasingly tech and data-driven and automated, what do you see of the, for the role of linguists, cultural experts, and human analysts in, in a, an agency like yours? Um, critical? Uh, again, go to your, go to your ISO question, right? We're, it's gonna be less and less about seeing right, visually seeing and detecting, and much more about sensing. And, and you sense in ways that are much more subtle and particular to the, that Cardillion key that I used in the 1980s to figure out which Soviet bombers were on which base kind of thing. So, and, and I'm very pleased to say and very happy with our ability to recruit the kinds of talent because I need linguists and I need, I need data scientists, and I need people that can figure out how to filter what could be an overwhelming amount of imagery in a way that creates coherence where we're at risk of having it look chaotic. Can you give an example? Let's say there's someone at Georgetown majoring in Russian studies, fluent in Russian. You know, maybe they think they would go to a, an, another agency, intel agency, to provide their services. What kind of contribution could they make at NGA? One, we've got the nicest facility in the intelligence community. It's true. Isn't it? It's true. Yeah, all right. See, Wall Street Journal can't ask uh, this. Uh, you could uh, use a room like this, though, but. We could. I do love this room, too. Um, uh, t look, uh, I mean, my, my most honest answer is, is if you're enthused and interested, and I would love to have you join the intelligence community wherever you found the best fit. However, now, gonna, uh, now let me be, you know, get my elbows out and say, yes, I want to compete for you, which I do. Uh, we're on the cusp in this profession. We're on the cusp of, of a revolution. And the days, okay, again, look, I'm very proud of what I did as an analyst, but it was kind of a simple life, all right? It was pretty set piece. Workflow came in, did your work, workflow went out, you know, and it was a bit like a factory. Boy, today is so dynamic, and, and again, some of that goes to the threat that I spoke to, but it also goes to the potential of how we can come to understand opportunities and risks associated with those threats. So, again, all, because I know my colleagues will be here today, I don't, yes, he disparaged all, everyone else in the IC, uh, there's exciting places to work throughout our community. Um, I do think NGA geospatial intelligence has a somewhat of a unique advantage because of what we're on the edge of commercially, academically, you know, in, in, you know, with this move to the open. One of the things we've seen with the FBI related to this, the FBI, um, NSA, is the tremendous amount of um, corporate interest, Silicon Valley and elsewhere, in those workers, right? I mean, ex if you're an expert in cyber, Imagine if you're an expert in geospatial intelligence, there's a huge market for your skills. Are you, and that's a plus and a minus, I imagine, for a director, are you having to deal with that? You know, is there a lot of companies trying to lure your best talent away? Um, you know, is that, is that a struggle? I mean, it, it's true. I mean, I, you know, look, uh, some of my colleagues that I grew up with work at Digital Globe, right? And, but we're still colleagues, all right? They, we just work. They're working for a particular reason to support my mission, and they're doing it a certain way to respect their shareholders, et cetera. Um, but at the end of the day, even when I have, you know, what could be a tough talk with a partner like that, it, it, we're still connected via the mission. Um, it drives Digital Globe just as it drives me. So my answer is yes, there is a competition. I happen to think it's healthy. Again, I think, I, I, 
I think I'd be better served, I think the taxpayer would be better served if I made that door a little easier. Because oftentimes with, the, with our system, it's kind of binary. You know, you're gonna go to Silicon Valley, right. tends to be a one-way street. Uh, we should make it easier to let people go do that if that's what they seek to do. But then also hold open the opportunity to reinvest what they've learned you know, in that environment back within our spaces. Um, here's that's a question our, from Sasha. That's our last question. Oh, last question from Sasha Smith. Uh, you mentioned radicalization in your open re opening remarks. How does homegrown radicalization or the potential for this impact uh, how the NGA of the future would combat that? So it's, boy, that's a good last question. Um, it's, I mean, that threat is obviously one of the most difficult we face as a community. Um, NGA's value proposition for that today is not that high for a couple reasons. One, remember, don't do anything domestically, right, right without help, but let's say the FBI came to us uh, for assistance. Um, you know, Damien, I have to say, as I think through the answer right now, I don't see it as a huge growth industry for us in this business. But maybe that could be one of the things we talk about later today. I mean, I'm, because I'm really not sure, as I sit here today, when I think about areas for us to move into, that's going to be a, a, a big one. Okay, great. Well, I'd like to thank Director Cardillo and thank the audience. We have a break and then another really interesting panel. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot.